Hello, we're recording this live from Augsburg. Um, at the, we're at the Smooth Jazz Festival 2010. And I'm sitting down here with uh, Mr. Chuck Lope. Hello. Hello. Thank you for taking your time um, to speak with us. My on pleasure. Behalf, on behalf of smoothjazznow.com. So this is um, really a unique opportunity and a unique moment for me to be sitting here with you and talking about your music. We witnessed a great show yesterday uh, on the first night and you were so generous as to sit in despite <laughs> travel and everything and, uh, and you just you know, delivered a stellar performance Thank you. every time and, and the consistency is something that um, seems to be very unique to your, uh, to your career. People and also um, industry um, representatives um, keep mentioning that that your consistency over the years has never failed in any way. I mean, you always deliver top-notch quality. How do you do well, that? Well, I mean, uh, I think that uh, for for example, yesterday, um, when you come, one of the nice things about being a musician is that when we travel, because many people travel for business and work, uh, but when they get there, maybe the work isn't quite as much fun as it is for us. You know, and because we travel and it's a difficult day and everything, uh, we get there and we're going to share music with people. So what what could be better than that? So we show up and and there's Rick Braun and Schultz and a great band and a beautiful venue and public and everybody's waiting to to hear music. So it actually instead of making it more difficult or more tiring, it gives you energy and it gives me a burst of energy to get up on stage and play with everybody. And we had as you know as you know we were kind of doing it in the spirit of fun, you know, uh, spontaneity and all that. So uh, it's, it's an energizing feeling for me and hopefully for the audience, you know, I hope. You know. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It was totally apparent how you were energized. I mean, we, we could see that. Um, for the audience, I have to explain, he sat in uh, with the band and the guitar wasn't even his own guitar, so he had never played this guitar before. And the, the strap, the strap um, on, over his shoulder was too short, so he had to stand. No, no, it was too long. Too long, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah it was yeah. too long, so he had, he had to stand there and hold the guitar while he was playing. I cannot, I'm a guitar, guitar player myself, I can't imagine how you managed it, but you did, yeah. and you totally, you know, you totally well, delivered. It, it was it. funny, because, you know, like a lot of, guitar players, rock guitar players, and, and you know, is you hold it down low, so the guitarist playing the band had his guitar very low down, and I can't play like that because I'm used to playing more like in a jazz style, and um, so I had to sit down, and then after a while, you know, I wanted to get up in this part of the stage where Rick was, so I had to put the guitar down on the floor and play it like this, so it was a lot of fun. I hope to get some some footage of that. I, I shot that with the camera. I oh, you did? The, okay, the cool. Footage came out right. Yeah, that was. <laughs> I don't know what it sounded like, but it looked. <clears throat> I would like to speak about your last um, record as a as a leader first, and then maybe okay. we can uh, segue into um, a little bit of foreplay. You know, you yeah, know, sort of the, the the latest stage, I guess, in my career. And you know, uh, yeah, I would love to talk about that a little bit because we. Foreplay just recorded a, a new CD, and it's the first one that I'm involved with, and and so we'll talk about that. It's, okay. it's an exciting uh, step for me. We'll start with Between Two Worlds. That's your um, last release as a um, as a leader. Yeah. It came out in 2009. Yes. When I did my research on this, um, what I found amazing is that you at least put out one record per year, at least one, as a leader. Well, leader. Oh yes, yeah. Including including other projects, definitely, or more. Yeah. There's more. That's what yeah. I was going to say. You know, I mean, yeah. um, those are the significant ones as leader. But right. you are involved in so many other projects, and they're all listed. And it's, it's um, again, I would have to ask, how do you manage? How do you balance it, especially with touring? You have family. You uh, live between two worlds, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, would you like to comment on that? How do you? Yeah. Um, I think uh, the answer actually is, is kind of visual. You see these bags under my eyes. You know, I don't sleep a lot. No, it's. <laughs> It's, it's partially um, because the music business is, you know, when, when, you, when you work in the, in, in the music business, it's very important to be doing a lot of different things because um, when one thing ends, uh, for example, when I do my own CD, like Between Two Worlds was March of 2009 was the release. I won't do another CD until probably March, April, or May of 2011, so it's two years. And I think as, as a musician, you're always trying to keep the flow going of the creativity, because it's, it's uh, well, first of all, it's a reality of work, because you want to have you know, income from different projects coming in. But also, um, I think Miles Davis once said, I think it was him that said, music is an addiction. And it is, really. I mean, I think playing music and being 
part of the creativity is addictive, and listening to it too is addictive. You know, when you find something that you really like, it's like, I want to listen to that again, I want to listen again, I want to eat more of that artist or whatever, which is a good thing, you know, it's a good addiction, you don't have to go to rehab for it. <laughs> but That's... for me, you know, it's like, I'm already like starting to think about what I'm going to do next when I'm in the middle of the next, of the last project, because, uh, and I want to keep that feeling going. The consistency that you mentioned before and, and that you're saying is very important to me because I think that uh, not only consistency from project to project, but consistency within a project. For example, um, the best compliment that somebody can say is, well, um, when I put on your CD, I don't just listen to one or two tracks. I like the whole thing. I listen to the whole record and I like the last track and I like the first track. Because I think sometimes people focus on like, you know, the main tracks and then the other ones become sort of like what they call album tracks or something like that. But I think that there should be uh, a consistency, even in this day and age when people buy songs more than they buy CDs, I still think it's important to have a project that has an overall balance to it, you know. And, and um, when I'm making a, a CD, I, I, I think often where on a CD each song is going to be. Oh, and yeah. that, that in the sequence and that that makes it uh, have a certain character and I might want to build up uh, a certain energy in a song or less energy or whatever in a certain area so that it fits into the big picture but consistency I think is a very important thing and I, and, and I think um, you know it's inspiring to me to hear you say that other people say that about me because that's that's I would say it's important you know it's really important to me itself right? yeah no doubt about it I think you know no matter what you do in life uh, what is what is evident is that when people really put a lot of effort and the work ethic is strong the product is is uh, it shows it shows in the in the end result of the music now it's interesting uh, because sometimes sometimes things come out great in the first take you know so there might be a, a time where, the, where, like, you can overwork something. Right. Like, if something's good, you know, you have to have the ability to be... And I see people like, uh, you mentioned foreplay, now I'm working with foreplay, like someone like Bob James, for example. Um, he's an example of someone that has the maturity as an artist to be able to say, it's done, it's finished, let's just move on and do wow. something else and it's really something that you have to learn because sometimes you become too much of a perfectionist you say well it could be this it could be that it could be this but if you can listen to it and say well that captured the magic of the moment you got to let it be you know and, and i would assume that to be a very hard to, a tough decision to make it to, is to really it is yeah because yeah you never know what might be around what might be under that that other stone and sometimes that can only happen when there's an objective other person involved. Um, like for example, my family life is very centered around music because my wife is a singer and a songwriter and a recording artist. My daughter is a singer and a songwriter and a recording artist. My other daughter is very musical. She's not in the business, but she's also very musical. And um, so sometimes I'll be um, working on a track, let's say playing on a record for someone, and I'm working on a track, whether it's my own or somebody else's, and I'll be playing over and over and over and over again, trying to get it to be exactly right, exactly perfect, and I, I just can't be objective anymore. Yeah. And sometimes I'll just say to Carmen, my wife, Carmen Cuesta, and say, Carmen, just, just come in here and tell me to stop <laughs> when it's done, okay? Because I, I, and she'll do that, or my daughter will do it, and, uh, you know, and so in the situation where where you're by yourself, um, it takes a lot. It really takes a lot of effort. And sometimes the the correct thing to do is to say, "I'm not going to play anymore. I'm just going to walk away and go have a coffee and take a walk, do something else, and then come back. And then when you come back and you listen to it and say, "Oh well, it's almost there. You know, just a little thing here and there, and then it'll be done." <laughs> Music has been integral to our relationship from the beginning because uh, we met because I was playing with Stan Getz in Madrid. She's from Madrid. She came to see, she was a big fan of Bossa Nova, so she went to, to see Stan Getz and we met. And when we met, she played her songs for me and she heard me play with him. And so it's always been very 
integral to our relationship. And then in terms of recorded collaborations, as soon as I began recording, she was part of those projects. And then when she was recording her own projects, I was part of those. So it's always been just assumed that's what, that's what we were going to do. Um, and now, you know, our daughter, uh, Lizzie Loeb, or Elizabeth Loeb, you know, she's a singer, very much like her mom, plays the guitar like me, and then she's a composer, and she's really got her own style. Uh, so it's just continuing on, you know, with the same collaborative spirit, which is great. And, and it's uh, in our household, especially uh, maybe about let's say 15 years, 10 or 15 years ago, where we had, I was doing a lot of production, and I had my recording studio in the garage, and both my, my daughters were in high school, and, or, you know, going through high school, and every day there was, like, musicians coming in and out, and bands, and, you know, one day it would be Gatto Barbieri, the next day it would be Michael Brecker, and the next day it would be, you know, you know, Michelle Camillo, or whatever, and then, so it was always, like, all these people coming in, so, it was really just part of our life, you know. Carmen would be doing the laundry, and you know, there would, you know, Michael Brecker would walk by, and then, you know, <laughs> come and say, "Hello, Carmen," you know, I'm going to play, and then, you know, so it's, it was a really awesome, very, very cool existence. Yeah, I mean, the internet, the advance of uh, computer chips and memory, and the. the uh, the improvement of digital recording, because at first digital recording wasn't quite as good, but now, but within the last 15, 20 years, it's gotten to be the best way to record. Uh, we're recording this interview digitally, and, and it comes out great. Um, all of that, the advances have improved the ability for people to do projects in a more democratic way. In other words, when I was young, when I was starting out, if I wanted to record uh, an album or a CD or an LP at that time, right? You had to go to a very expensive studio. You had to hire a, a, a bunch of people to work and work the machines and, and set up the microphones and all that kind of stuff. And now, you know, somebody can buy a computer and they can have GarageBand and they can do a pretty good recording, you know, for next to nothing. Um, it's, made it, it's made it better in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, there's elements of it that are missing from the old days that are that are a little bit um, sad, because being a studio musician, for example, in New York City, I used to go from session to session and play with different musicians on every session, different kinds of music, and it was a very socially interactive thing. And the chemistry that different musicians had playing together was magical. I think a little bit of that gets lost when somebody does a track in Los Angeles and they send it to someone in New York and someone in Chicago mixes it and it's okay, it's good, it, it's, it's good and it gets things done and it keeps the creativity going. I have nothing against it, but there is an element or are elements that suffer, I think. Now there is a little bit of, of uh, improvement in that area now with Skype because you can actually have some, somebody else, you know, like sort of listening to you. It's a little bit difficult, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the, as things get even more based on the internet. My CDs and the CDs I've been involved with uh, for the last, you know, 10 years at least, have been very much, um, okay, I record the basic tracks, but then a lot of overdubs and a lot of other parts get done sort of in a vacuum because, you know, you're, you're, I'm playing in my house. I'll send it to Brian Culbertson at his house and he'll play it and send it back and Eric Marenthal, et cetera, et cetera like on, on Between Two Worlds, you know, Brian Culbertson played the trombone on, on Let's Go, the song, but, you know, we weren't together in the same room, you know, we talked on the phone, we sent an email, I sent him the track, he played it, okay, that's great. Foreplay, when I joined, uh, you know, Foreplay asked me to become a member of the band when Larry Carlton left in uh, January this year. Uh, so I joined the band, I did one show in Florida, at the Seabreeze Jazz Festival in Florida. And then um, the next thing we did was we went into the studio to record. All right, wow. So it was like a big wow. like jump. I had to compose some music for the, for the recording. The great thing about that was that when they record, they go into a studio all together. Okay. And they stay all together right. the whole time. And it was fantastic. Okay. It was fantastic yeah. because it was like the old days. It was like, you know, you sit around and you say, how about this? How about that? 
you're playing something, Nathan will come over and say, that's great, but try this. And wow, what a great feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Harvey Mason is in the same room, like 10 feet away from you playing the drums. So like the energy of that is quite different than hearing it in the headphones only, you know. So uh, the album harkens back to, you know, the, 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 the mystery and the magic and the romance of people playing together. And I think it shows that. As soon as people come together and you, you go out on the stage, like no matter what we talked about in the dressing room about playing together, Rick and I and Schilt, we went out on stage and something completely different happened because nobody knew that the guitar strap was going to be too long. <laughs> nobody knew that we would end up, all three of us, down on our knees. Playing. All this is taking place with the energy and the spirit of the people uh, sitting there listening and enjoying it and, and they become part of it. So that's, there's this whole like energy and, and thing that, that exists that, that doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't exist that's when right. you're just recording that's in a right. computer. So the, you know, the, uh, the album before Between Two Worlds, my album Between Two Wor before that was called Presence. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea for that album for me was uh, presence being the actual presence of a person. I get it. Okay. okay. Because, and the importance of that in music and in life in general. Because talking on a phone is one thing, but when you're face to face with somebody, or, you know, that's why I think, you know, like even on, I mean, I'm getting kind of deep here, but on, on, on a world stage, for example, if um, you have the president of Israel over here and the, and, and the president of Palestine over here, and they're saying one thing and he's saying another thing, and if somebody, you know, if Barack Obama says, hey, let's get together in one room and talk about this, everything changes when you're right in front of the other person, right? Because there's a feeling there's a humanity. So it's the same thing in, in, in music. The name of the CD is Let's Touch the Sky, which is the name of a Bob James composition. Wow, yes. And I think that's, that's, we all, there was a lot of different opinions about the, the title. It's a very democratic band. So everybody has to agree, and if people don't agree about, you know, whatever the issue is, they, we vote. In fact, you know, we, we were down to the title of the CD. There was some question about, some people felt one way, some people felt another way. The sequence of the songs, all of it. We voted on all of it. Wow. And I thought, wow, it's fantastic. And uh, it wasn't always easy, but, but it came out good and everybody was happy at the end. Oh, yeah. So it's called Let's Touch the Sky, and I think that that sums up the thing that I was talking about before, is that like the feeling that we had in the studio together was, let's go for it, let's really reach for something. And Bob wrote this beautiful song, and that line, Let's Touch the Sky, comes from a poem by E. e. Cummings, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, uh, that's what it's about. It's about let's trying to uh, take this as far as we can go. Right. Any, any element of life that uh, brings people together, there's a lot of, dive, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people go through, are going through a different, difficult time right now in the world, you know, like economically and politically. And, and so anything that can bring people together is good. I've always felt that music is a mysterious thing, but it really is such a unifying force, right? Um, that... You know, sometimes I feel like, wow, I'm so lucky. I, I, you know, I get to play music for a living, and it's not fair. You know, there's so many people that don't get to do stuff that they like for a living. But um, many times I'll say that to friends of mine, let's say, you know, or something like that, and uh, and they say, no, 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 what you're doing is really important. It's really important. Music is important because it, it makes people better able to deal with what they have to deal with. And so I think that's true. You know. It's a responsibility, and, and I, it makes me feel better, you know, that, to know that it, if it, whatever little thing helps somebody's day or life, that's, that's a great thing. Hiram is a song composed for uh, the great guitarist Hiram Bullock, who passed away a couple of years ago, right before, right as I was finishing up the CD. And um, I was trying to think if I could, you know, think of a clever name for the song that referred to some kind of story from our relationship as friends in New York and all that. But um, in the end, I just wanted it to just be about him. So I just called it Hiram and, and uh, you know, 
people that know him, you know, it's like that song in particular doesn't really sound like a Hiram Bullock song, really. It's my, it's my homage to him, you know. But I think the spirit um, was there, and, and I was lucky to be able to have one of, I know one of his closest, closest friends, maybe the closest friend that he had was Will Lee, and Will played um, a bass on it. And the bass that he played, it's kind of funny, uh, you know, Hiram played with Jocko Pastorius, and, the ba- and Will knew Jocko as well. And the bass that Will played on that song was, was Jocko's bass. Oh my goodness, I'm yeah. getting shivers almost. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and Carmen, who also knew Jocko and, and everybody, was singing along, and, and, and it was just had this amazing like feeling, you know, like... Uh, and um, actually, Will only had that bass, for I think two days, and one of the days was when he was recording that song. Oh goodness! So yeah. it wow. was really cool. Wow. But it's it's um, it came out really well, and I play that song live for people, and it really it gets a great reaction. People people get the feeling, you know. Well, I mean, I think the idea is always there. The idea is like you know, now I'm working on a record. I it's almost assumed that that Carmen will be part of the project, or now Lizzie as well, because you know she's such. Big part of our lives. The song that is the title, um, the it's called Between Two Worlds. I was working on a song, um, completely different thing, and Carmen was practicing the guitar in a different part of our, of our house, and she came in and said, you know, I've got this idea and I want to record it right away so I don't forget it. You know, I was using the studio, so she came in and the mic was already set up, and I said, yeah, go ahead, you know, and she starts playing this song, and I was like, I think I'm going to steal this song. <laughs> and so I said, what if we connected what I was working on with this, and within like an hour, we had this song, you know? No, really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and uh, of course, then it took a while. I you know, had to build it up from there and produce it. But, but the thing came together literally out of thin air. You know, she was practicing, I was doing something else, and it came together. Growing up in New York City and being a musician in that environment, um, I did have the opportunity to play a lot of different styles of music um, over the 40 years that I've been playing music. You know, I started out you know, playing R&B and rock and roll and all that stuff, and then when I was in the city, you mentioned Latin music, for example. The, one of the very first uh, things I did in New York City was to play with the Ray Barreto, who was a great Latin conga player, and he had a band that was kind of a fusion of salsa and uh, Latin music and jazz and fusion and everything and I played with them for a couple of years and I really learned a lot about that and then I got a chance to play with Chico Hamilton and Hubert Laws and so the elements I think the hands-on experience in other words again you can learn how to play Latin music from listening to records and practicing and doing all that stuff but if you get an opportunity to, to do that in a real setting where you're playing with a real band that really like it really drives it home. So I, I'm lucky, I'm really lucky that being a New Yorker and being in all those experiences, I've been able to, and then, you know, it's natural, I think, to then incorporate those experiences into your own right. expression. First of all, um, be, just because of, the, because of my relationship with Carmen, uh, 30 years ago, Spain became my adopted second country. And um, so I learned the language. I learned to speak, not not perfectly, but I, I can do okay. You know, I can I can defend myself, as they say. <laughs> and and um, the lifestyle in Spain. I mean, we're here in Europe. You're European, so you know, the lifestyle in Spain is quite nice. You know, it's quite weather, really beautiful thing. weather, great food, great wine, pretty nice, relaxed lifestyle. And so as soon as I, I became hip to that, it was kind of like a no-brainer, you know. <laughs> okay. uh, but I'm American, I grew up in America, I feel very American, you know, and, and uh, grew up li- listening to American music and, and always a part of my, and in particular New York, because I'm from New York, you know, so uh, never give that up, and I feel very close to that. Um, with foreplay, I'll be drawn back a little bit more into, because I was working more and more in Europe, uh, I was still going back and forth all the time, but with foreplay I will definitely be, you know, playing quite a bit more in the States, but also all over the world. 
Um, the new CD, Let's Touch the Sky, coming out in October, we're immediately going to China, and then we come back, we're playing in California, and then we go to Japan. We just came back from playing in South Africa. It's a very global band, and, uh, and, and all, you know, my career in general has been that. In the last couple of years, I mean, I've gotten a chance to play in India and Russia and Africa and, Amazing. you know, all over the world. So it's really great. Um, but, you know, I think that the uh, two worlds thing has really enriched my life, first of all, because, you know, I love Europe and I love being involved, like being here in Germany. I love it here. It's got a very special feeling, you know, and I now, now I've been here so many times. Uh, you know, my friends, you know, like Wolfgang Hafner and Till Bronner and Christian yeah. Diener. These people are like, you know, part of my life. So it really enriches your experience, enriches your, you know, I take something back with me every time I go back um, that I think helps the music, you know. And, uh, and yet at the same time, like I said, I'm American, I'm from New York, so I feel very much like a New Yorker and an American guy. So uh, I guess the, the whole thing that comes out this is the idea of between two worlds, you know, it, it creates kind of a new, new reality. So in closing this interview, it's, I, I must say I've been tremendously enjoying this. and, and oh, you've been Me very, too. I hope that we can uh, also welcome you back to, to Augsburg. We hope for that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a great experience so far. My own shows tonight, but I mean, it's just it's just great to be here uh, again. I played play like I said, played in Germany a lot, but to be here, particularly for a smooth jazz festival, is really good. You know, because it means that this kind of music is growing here, and there's and it was full last night, so I guess it's popular here. And, and people uh, had a great time. And yeah, the, yeah, the, I, you could tell. Time. Yeah, everybody's having a good time. And it's a beautiful place. I mean, you can probably see from, from where we are how, how, how nice it is. And uh, I would love to come back, and I hope I can do whatever I can do to try to spread the word because, I, you know, we want people to, uh, to experience this music and, and to share it. Smooth jazz is a term, you know, like any other term. It's not one thing it's a very wide array of things if you saw all the different performers right as you did yes. they're all very different you that's know? right that's and right. so it's it's an umbrella everybody gets under the umbrella and uh and hopefully it brings the people together and then the music can grow and go where people want it to you know and i definitely want to be a part of it in the future here in germany and throughout europe and well thank you so much my Mr. pleasure Doug. really and great I'm looking forward greatly to the show tonight and thank you so much my pleasure thank you thank you